If you'd like to watch the entire webinar, please click the link below and join us. Welcome to the Argument for Permaculture. I'm Matt Powers, author, teacher, seed saver, gardener, and family guy. And I have been studying permaculture for a long time, as almost as long as I've been gardening. And I've been teaching permaculture to thousands of students in my online courses, and then to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands more online through social media and YouTube. And I have distilled this argument down from all that experience. And in many ways, this is a condensing of the first two weeks of a PDC, but it's to show you why people get so excited about permaculture. And it's also to give you the reasoning why permaculture is more important now than ever. And, you know, in this current world that we're in, it can feel like there was a before and after not too long ago. Before the lockdowns, you would have been kind of seen as crazy a little bit or a little bit paranoid to be a prepper. And people who homesteaded, people who grew their own food, kind of seen as hippies, and people who were preppers and survivalists were kind of seen as extreme. And the concept of shortages, travel restrictions, and lockdowns sounded all kind of crazy. And after the lockdowns, there's a realization that food shortages, supply shortages, supply chain disruptions, power outages, rationing, droughts and flooding, and crazy weather are now a part of reality and you kind of can't avoid them any longer. It's not the state over there or that coast or it's happening everywhere. We need to be prepared, especially if you have family, especially if you have older folks, especially if you have people on medications that they can't miss a month. And if they miss even just a few days, it can be catastrophic. So there's something I learned in all my studies, something that Alan Savory talks about, how stress in the land is mirrored by stress in people. And so we're seeing that play out. We have all sorts of problems, but there's kind of some watersheds to look at. Desertification is the net result of soil degradation, deforestation, in many ways pollution, dead zones, um, water scarcity, of course, ocean acidification, mass extinction. And I know that there's a, a, an argument going around being saying that we're not in a the sixth mass extinction, but we have lost 50% of biodiversity in the past 100 years. So that's that's massive. Regardless if it's one of the six mass biggest ones, that's that's different. We don't know that until it's over. Climate change. Desertification on a local level changes the weather. It causes more droughts and flooding. And it causes the, the water cycle to, to come all at once and be erosive and, and, and destroy the landscape more than it nourishes the landscape. With the loss of trees, the loss of soil, the loss of places for habitat, for life, you have a, a, a desert being formed and desert climates are very different from the temperate and tropical and rainforest climates. And so desertification, while it's not you know sexy and not being promoted, is a, a really an old concept that's been happening this whole time and everyone knows it, it's not controversial, and it's really the net result of all of these things. And human disconnection is reflects this stress because everything really is connected. It all relates to our world becoming less fertile and more barren. That's what desertification is. We are headed for a desert planet, kind of like Dune. Did you guys watch that? I watched it. It was so good. I was obsessed with that book, though. And, you know, I read it over a dozen times as a kid. And I even reread it as an adult with my son. 
My youngest son is reading it right now, and it is such a good book. One of the things that I was really fascinated by was terraforming. One of the things I, I felt when I heard Elon Musk's plan to go inhabit Mars was that <laughs> why terraform Mars when we need to terraform Earth? We're not far off the mark here at Earth. <laughs> and and we could heal it. It's not that badly damaged in the scheme of things. Like w we can bring things back. It's not Mars. You know, in the in the universal scheme of things in the universe, right? Right. These other planets are not habitable in 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 any sense, really. And so Earth's got everything we need on it. So why not make it happen here? So ethical terraforming, making sure that we're not destroying habitat or promoting life. And by doing that, by partnering with nature, leveraging technology carefully and wisely, we can make this happen. This is what permaculture has been for me. But, you know, in fact, it's been way more than that. And it was, it was that at first. But as it's opened up and as I've studied it, it more, it's, it's how we're always going to be prepared, not just as, as individuals, but as communities and cultures. Co-founders and co-creators of the, the concept permaculture, David Holmgren and Bill Mollison, distilled all the world's longest lasting and most regenerative cultures into universal ethics and principles. So they were looking at Edo period Japan, where the population, the overpopulation was greater in cities than it is now. And they figured it out without all the technology we have today. So there are fertile time periods that are regenerative or aspects that are regenerative in cultures all over the world. But the main ones that they distilled it from for, for the methods in the early permaculture design manuals and books was Japan and China, specifically Farmers of 40 Centuries. This F.H. King book is incredible. This is this has inspired so many people. But primarily it was the indigenous cultures around them, the Australian aboriginals and Tasmanian aboriginals that inspired them. And David was 17 years old writing his thesis. He was a young, you graduated young from college at 17, genius. And a university professor lived in the same building, in the same house as him, they're housemates. And that was Bill Mollison. And he was a professor working on a theory for everything. So they combined forces and wrote that first book. Bill went out to promote it. And and then Bill also helped map the entire genealogy of the Tasmanian Aboriginal people, and that gave them land rights. So really incredible people we're talking about. They came up with these distilled ethics and principles to guide regenerative action so that we can go out in the world and heal the natural world and live ethically and responsibly. So the three ethics and the permaculture principles together combined, they imply deeper things as you can see that I've added in, but they are earth care, people care, and future care. And we'll get into the third ethic later if that's like a knee jerk reaction moment there for you. <laughs> But we're gonna go through each of these one by one. This was originally a visualization for a book that I'm, I'm still in the process of writing. It's actually a updated version and an extension of this book, which is uh, an earlier edition of this book is free on my website, thepermaculturestudent.com. So check that out. And it's over 400 pages. It's a PDF. You can just download it or you can listen to it on YouTube on my YouTube channel. Subscribe there. And I, I read it as an audiobook for you. So that's there for you to check out. That's my gift to you. It is a book that is part of a curriculum that is the first accredited for high school credit in North America, but only in British Columbia so far. We're going to branch out hopefully soon. Um, but 
that book is there for you. It's free. You can download it or you can listen on, on YouTube as a full audio book while you're working, while you're driving. And, and I'm going to be going into that book eventually, Advanced Permaculture. I'm going to finish writing it. This is my outline. This is how I think about it. So I'm going to run you through all of these, these different aspects right now, right here. And then we're going to go through the principles. And then I'm going to explain why this helps us be prepared why it's something that will benefit everyone, why you want it in your life. So, and more of it if it's already in your life. So this is exciting. I'm really excited to talk about this with you because um, this is something that has been on my mind and I've been working on for years. Earth care. The way I was visualizing it when I began permaculture was basing everything off the PDC and what Bill Mollison had already written. And so I was focused on kind of translating their work and updating it by going over their research and looking for new insights to bolster it or complicate it or expand it. And one of the things I came across was the fact that um, other than, you know, aquaculture and some pond culture kinds of things, the ocean just wasn't even talked about uh, in, in riparian areas wild water was not discussed and so I kind of just kind of put it to the side and was like oh well the ecologists can help with that and then as I learned more about what ecologists do and don't do I realized that that that's not going to work at all for the future of our wild places they're not going to help them and so it's really up to us to as as a culture to value these places and to value stewards of these places that will improve them. And one of the huge gaping spaces that I saw in blind spots and permaculture as I went through this and started trying to adapt it to science curriculum for university and high school students was there's nothing about the ocean. And so I took it upon myself to start doing the research and start learning from experts and have them show me what they know to be the pathway to healing the ocean. And in the process, I learned incredible things that we're about to go over. But let's start with land care, because uh, that's the most obvious. This is a picture from Regrarians from Darren Doherty, and it's one of my favorite pictures. It's featured in the Regenerative Career Guide, and this picture you can really see how key line design is beautiful. Land is the foundation for all economies and cultures because it's our interaction relationship with land that allows us to have economies and culture. So in permaculture and earth care and land care specifically is care for natural systems and it's rehabilitating degraded or damaged ecosystems and creating our own beneficial living spaces. So in many ways, this is just practicing permaculture design on a homestead, essentially, and doing our part to help the larger ecosystem. And this is where permaculture design comes in. This is what people are getting their PDC to be able to do. And we're really good at this part in permaculture. You know, uh, this is Mark Shepard's new forest farm. This is featured in that book. Same thing with Jeff Lawton's farm. It's featured in that book, Zaytuna. This is the main focus for many people, and that's okay there's more to it. The only ethical decision is to take responsibility for our own existence and that of our children. Make it now. So making that beneficial living ecosystem that we can thrive within so we stop pulling from the natural capital around us, from the environment around us, is so key. But it needs to be broader than that. Ocean care. We need to think about the oceans. 70% of the world is water. 70% of your body is water. Though the open ocean is like an open tundra. And it's the coasts where the life primarily is. And it's where all the nurseries, all the delicate fertile areas are around the coasts. The reefs are just off the coast or in shallow waters. The the ability for life needs that calmer, more fertile area. And sadly, it's where we park our boats and where often things get dumped. 
California's massive offshore oil spill. This is happening right now. Not only that, since 2014, before this even happened, 90% of kelp is gone off the coast of Northern California. So the Southern coast is being poisoned by that. And not only that, off of Catalina Island, close to Santa Barbara in LA, there's an incredible amount of DDT dumped in that water. 25,000 barrels of toxic DDT. And if you took the SATs, you know Rachel Carson's silent spring. This is the DDT they're talking about, okay? So this is the thing that launched the environmental movement. This is the thing that launched the Environmental Protection Acts. It was Rachel Carson's silent spring. This is what got people aware that these chemicals were dangerous. So this is there. Tons and tons and tons and tons of it killing everything and the surfers are going swimming in it every day. The oceans provide 50 to 90% of our oxygen depending on your location and time of year. If you are in the middle of Iowa in the middle of winter, your oxygen is not coming from evergreens. They don't photosynthesize in winter. They just hang on. It's coming from the ocean. So in other words, in the middle of the country, the ocean is providing your air. This is why, and there is some exchange, but not much with the other hemisphere. It's incredible. There's a three-year exchange is what they've, what they've been able to figure out. So it's not much exchange. So there's an incredible dearth of photosynthetic generated oxygen in winter, and we owe the oceans for that oxygen. So it's incredibly important that we protect our oceans, we protect the photosynthesizers. Those kelp forests were creating oxygen, and now they are gone. And all these plants and animals on the coast, they're edge species, and they're an example of the power of the edge effect. That is where two edges, two ecosystems meet, there's a third group of just edge species. You have the land animals, you have the water animals, you have the edge species, you have all of it combines to be more than two plus two equals four. It's an exponential growth. These are areas, they're hot spots of biodiversity. These areas are crazy fertile and it's cradles like this that allowed life to really take hold. So it's on us to protect these areas all over in nature so that they're fertile again and they protect the biodiversity in them. Because biodiversity care is something that, again, it's often not talked about, but in permaculture, when you set up a full homestead, you sometimes have endangered species just show up. Why? Because you got the best place and they just want to let you know. And so some people worry about, you know, folks getting uh, getting their, their house shut down or their site taken over and this can happen. So if you've got endangered species, perhaps be quiet about it. But you're doing a lot to take care of them by providing them a habitat. And that's really what, it's, what it comes down to is the lack of land and ocean care has led to a decline in biodiversity because that's their habitat. So the orangutans, I want to be able to, when I meet Willie Smiths in person, I've talked to Willie Smiths. Uh, I, I really respect Willie Smiths. If I'm on a panel with him, I'm sure he's going to go down the panel and be like, do you use palm oil? And he's going to let you know how wrong it is if you do. And I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready to be like, no, Willie, you touched my heart and I, and I never did again. I never bought that because I know, I know how bad it is. I want orangutans to live wild and free. And not only that, koalas, all those catastrophic fires, how much habitat did they lose? I've seen incredible numbers, like 80%, 90% of their habitat. This is an incredibly staggeringly high number. Mountain gorillas. They're becoming rarer and rarer and rarer. What will it be like to live in a world without wild animals? This is one of the main questions that Charles Eisenstein asks in climate. I'm really honored that he's going to be a speaker at our future in January. 
the conference, the online free conference, answering the question, what is your most hopeful and inspiring vision for the future? So I'm really excited to see what Charles has to say about that. But he asks us, how will it feel to be in a world knowing that there was wild animals here and that nature was this vibrant thing and now it's gone? It might be too much for the human heart and mind. And, you know, I don't buy this narrative going around that the biodiversity will just come right back. I, I, I know that they're talking about like former mass extinctions and, you know, evolution responds dramatically, but that's like millions of years. Like, let's be honest. That's not like... In, in, in your time period of, of you and your grandchildren. No. No. And it won't come back as gorillas. Like when we lose a specific type, it doesn't come back. You might have other things create wings or create a pattern that looks like that. We've seen that evolutionarily in the archaeological record, but... Biodiversity just doesn't come back. So we need to be stewards and responsible here. And not only that, the it's not that bad argument, the climate alarmist, but it's not a mass extinction. It's like you never know if it's a mass extinction until it's over 50% of the biodiversity of Earth. To say it's not that bad is just journalist baiting. And I, I really, that snarky journalist making the rounds with uh, Joe Rogan and Jordan Peterson and other people. They're giving them airtime. I don't know why. But his his proposition that things aren't that bad is ludicrous. The, th the thing is that the mainstream narrative is absolutely off base and their solutions are ludicrous. I agree. But to say that when, you know, the majority of the earth is desertified, that the oceans are in decline, it's global oxygen levels are in decline dramatically. And they've been in a nosedive for over 100 years, ever since we started measuring. You'd think that someone who's intelligent and responsible would would do better but that's the thing we've got a lot of people that just want want to hold the mic for a minute and get see get 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 some kind of attention you know it, it's really wild we're, we, we're in a situation where so many people are really confused and 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 the reality is if we just look at the information talk about it and use logic and what we already can know and verify it's all very clear, all very fixable, all very doable. And the burst and bloom, the catastrophizing, the fear, shopping, the hoarding, all these things help certain people and they don't help us. So I really question a lot of these, you know, they both sound like convenient lies that they're using to sell things. Uh, or to sound different, to get get on the mic for a second. So why do I feel this way though? You're like, Matt, explain yourself. So have you read the Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold? It was published one year after Aldo Leopold died. Many people consider him to be the godfather of ecology and the environmental movement in America. And he in the 20s and 30s was lamenting the loss of the wilderness and wild animals in America. The thing is the animals are so sensitive that tens of miles away, like 50 miles away, 30 miles away, any kind of human activity would send the animals further. So we didn't have to do much to disrupt things profoundly all across the U.S., but we went further and we deforested and replanted most of the U.S. And we 
planted it into a monoculture, leaving in many places, leaving out trees that we didn't like. So by removing the plants and the trees that particular animals, pollinators, insects all relied upon, we kicked out legs underneath the table long, long ago. And he was lamenting this, feeling like it was the end then, before the conservation movement had even begun. It's a rather depressing book, but it's fascinating to see how animals used to behave, how complex and how interesting their relationships really were, and how vibrant living ecosystems truly could be if, if we brought them back to America. And, you know, in many ways, uh, we'll touch upon one example of that actually happening in America later in this talk. You know, and if things just come back, we'd have mastodons back by now. I mean, right? So it's really about habitat loss and desertification. We have to bring back the wild spaces and all the animals we can to those spaces because they are the active stewards of all ecosystems. If you'd like to watch the entire webinar, please click the link below and join us. I'm Matt Powers. Grow abundantly, learn daily, and live regeneratively. Thank you for watching.